Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. I'm going to start this series on the book of Revelation. You know, there's a lot of sensationalism in movies and churches on YouTube about the last days. Um, And you see movies that have these cataclysmic events happening uh, or, you know, the end of the world. But I'm, I want to give a biblical perspective uh, to the book of Revelation because in the book of Revelation, um, a lot of people say it's hard to understand, but it's really not when you read it within the context in which it was written, right? The book of Revelation is not hard to understand. When you read it within the time, the lens of the time that it was written in, you know, you all have seen those Left Behind movies, uh, planes falling out of the sky and all this, you know, create these crazy things and, you know, apocalyptic type of scenarios and movies. And that's really not accurate, right? Even the whole statement, we're living in the last days or are we in the last days? That question is a false statement in question because when you read the Bible, the New Testament, the last days, they were already in the last days in their time, which then should give us some perspective about what the last days actually consist of, right? The last days is not like the very end of time before Jesus comes back. That's not the last days. The last days started when he got baptized at the Jordan River. So I'm going to go chapter by chapter. We're going to start with chapter one in this video. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants, even the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So there the word signified, it means codified, meaning codes and symbols. So the one thing you have to realize about the book of Revelation, that it is set in codes and symbols, right? So it's a symbolic book. Okay, so a lot of some of this stuff in there, you can't take it literally. It's symbolic. It's a symbol representing something, a, a truth of something. Okay, so this angel was sent by Jesus unto his servant John, who bear witness of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, now the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the spirit of prophecy. We often think of testimonies and we think of like victory outreach, people giving their testimony about their life. But really the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, even of all things that he saw, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written therein for the times at hand. So there's going to be commandments given by Jesus in this book that we are to keep. See, it's not enough to know about the last days, quote unquote, Bible prophecy, you have to keep the commandments of Jesus Christ, right? And notice this, he says, for the time is at hand. So Jesus says the time is at hand, it's near. That's what, now this was written in the 90s AD. So this means the events of the book of Revelation were gonna happen shortly after it was written. You know, a lot of people, when they get the book of Revelation, they make it so that all these events in the book of Revelation happen within just a few years, like at the very end of time, like these movies, these Christian movies, and, you know, you hear Christian, you know, all these so-called YouTube prophets and pastors. No, the events of the book of Revelation started to happen right after the writing of the book in the first century, the very end of the first century. Or even the middle, of the, you know. <clears throat> Actually, some of it started even happening like when Jesus ascended into heaven. We'll read that later. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Okay, so that's to God the Father. He's giving a greeting from God the Father, him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Okay, from the seven spirits that are before his throne. Those are seven angels, spirits and angels interchangeable. Seven angels before his throne. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, this is important. There's a distinction between the one who 
was, who is, who was, and is to come. That's the Father. Then Jesus Christ, which represents eternality, that statement, the one who is and was and is to come. Whereas Jesus Christ is described as the firstborn from the dead. Okay, he was raised from the dead, the first human being ever to be resurrected from the dead. He is the firstborn from the faithful witness, the martyr, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, the ruler of the kings of the earth. So he was made, he was enthroned as king upon his resurrection into heaven. Okay, that's important to understand. As most churches in America are teaching that when Jesus comes back, he's going to become king in earthly Jerusalem and rule over modern day Israel and the whole world for a thousand years. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he's already king on the throne of David. That's important. And that he already started his kingdom. A lot of people saying, well, Christ is going to come and, and start his kingdom and bring his kingdom. No, Christ's kingdom already began 2,000 years ago. He's already the firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth. And no, he rules over the kings of the earth. <laughs> he rules over the kings of the earth. He is the king of the earth, not Satan. Now, what you're going to hear a lot in 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 YouTube channels that are Christian, Christian churches and pastors and even movies that Satan is the ruler of this earth. Why? Because they, they go to 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 where it says Satan is the god of this world. Well, that word world means age. It means age. Not earth. Jesus says that the Father gave him all authority in heaven and earth. All things in heaven and earth have been given into his hand. John 3.33-36 Matthew 20.18 and also I believe John 3, 13, uh, 13, 3, or 3, 13. But either way, all things have been given into the Son of God's hand. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. So that comes, now that, the, John the Revelator is alluding to Psalm 89, 27. In Psalm 89, 27, Jehovah God says about the Davidic king of Bible prophecy. Okay. I will set his hand also on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry unto me, thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So that is what would be the cry of the Davidic king of Bible prophecy, who is Jesus Christ. I will also make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So that's exactly what the author of Revelation, John, is saying right there. He is the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's pulling from the Davidic covenant because that's a commentary, Psalm 89, in the Davidic covenant of Jehovah's promise to the Davidic king about the royal seed of David, that he'll make the royal seed of David his firstborn son higher than the kings of the earth, the title of inheritance. So this proves that Jesus is already on the throne of David and he already rules over the kings of the earth. He doesn't need to be on earth to do that. He already does that because when Jesus comes back, he doesn't start his kingdom. He completes his kingdom and hands it to the Father. And we don't. he doesn't reign from earthly Jerusalem. He will make this the new heavens. He will turn this into the new heavens and new earth. Unto him that loveth us and loosed us from our sins by his blood. Talking about Jesus. He loved us, he loosed us from our sins by his blood. And he made us to be a kingdom, to be priest unto his God and Father. So notice, he made us to be a kingdom of priests. So that making us to be a kingdom of priests was past tense at the cross. We're already kings and priests now. He made us, past tense, to be kings and priests unto his God and Father. So Jesus has a God, something you won't really hear from the churches. Jesus has a God and it's his Father, Jehovah. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. So notice, we've already been made kings and priests by way of Jesus cross, not a future. The modern day churches in America teach that we're not kings and priests yet. We'll only be kings and priests when Jesus Christ comes back. That's a lie. We're already kings and priests by what, by virtue of what he did at the cross, not a second coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they that pierced him and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn over him. Even so, amen. Okay. 
It's going to come back. <clears throat> Second Advent, last day. I am the Alpha and the Omega, saith the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. So now, that's about the Father. Why? Because the same language is being used of the Lord God in Revelation 1a as the greeting that was given from by John in Revelation 1.4, who was identified as the one who is, who was, and is to come. Okay? We know that's the Father because Christ is given a separate greeting two verses later as the firstborn from the dead. Because the one who is, and who was, and is to come, obviously is eternal, never died. Jesus died and then was firstborn from the dead. So obviously, the one who is, and who was, and who is to come in verse 8, the Almighty, is the Father. I, John, your brother, and partaker with you in the tribulation and kingdom and patience, which are in Jesus. So again, another statement that the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which is one of tribulation and patience, not utopianism, is already a present reality in the first century. Okay? It's already a present reality in the first century. Again, this, this refutes the nonsense that Jesus' kingdom doesn't yet exist. That Jesus' kingdom is future. No, Jesus' kingdom already began 2,000 years ago, this is why John in Revelation 1 can say that I, John, am your brother and partaker with you in the tribulation and kingdom and patience which are in Jesus, meaning he's partaking with his brothers and sisters in the present kingdom of Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and this was written in the first century. So if John is partaking in the kingdom of Jesus Christ in the first century, this means it was already in existence. Now, the Christian worldview, the, 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 the Christian worldview is that Jesus' kingdom is one of eternal struggle. It's not utopianism. The Judeo worldview, which is a utopian worldview, says that in order for the Messiah's kingdom to be present, there has to be a utopia. Tikkun olam, repairing the world. No, but Christ's kingdom is one of picking up your cross. Christ's kingdom is signified by his cross, meaning it's a kingdom of struggle, eternal struggle. And so to be in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, you have to pick up your cross and deny yourself and struggle. That's what the kingdom of Jesus Christ is. It's not a utopia where everything's fair. And that's the difference between the Christian worldview and the Judeo worldview. And the Judeo worldview has taken over the, the Western churches where they say Christ's kingdom isn't here yet. He's not king yet. He's only going to be king when he comes back to the earth, rules from within Jerusalem to have this utopia, utopian society. Utopianism is not Christian. Okay. I, John, am your brother and partaker with you in the tribulation and kingdom and patience, which are in Jesus, which was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Again, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And the testimony of Jesus, when you go to First Peter chapter or Second Peter chapter one, is the words that were spoken to Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, adapted from Psalm 2 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, which is a royal Davidic coronation hymn showing that this, the testimony of Jesus Christ is that he is the Davidic king. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, What thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamum, Pergamum and unto Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to the Laodicea. Now, Many churches will grab this and they'll say those seven churches represent seven church ages. That's false. False. No, ev no evidence for that. Those seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia, and Laodicea, represent real churches that existed at that time. So what does that mean? This book of Revelation has to be relevant to the people that are living at the time the book is written in, which is in the 90s AD, first century. Now, don't get me wrong. The book of Revelation is very relevant for people today. But you have to understand it's also written for those, it's relevant for them, meaning the events of the Revelation started 2,000 years ago. They're not all going to happen in a short period of time. That leads to people getting very sensationalistic. <laughs> like a sky is falling mentality. Every time they read a newspaper article and see something happening. What the last days are, the last days aren't a quick, short space of time where everything goes wrong. The last days are simply a long, drawn-out war of attrition that began when Jesus Christ got baptized at the Jordan River and continue on through his second advent. 
And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the candlesticks, one like unto a son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and a gird about at the breast, with the golden girdle, and his head and his hair were white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. So his head and his hair were white. Okay, that eliminates the black Jesus thing that I believe is a deception in these last days. Okay, and it's proven all throughout the, the, the Bible that the Israelites were not black. Okay, so I, because that's a, a, a racist doctrine that is spreading like wildfire and it's false, it's antichrist. Okay. And notice it says his hair, his head and his hair were white. Okay. As white wool. It doesn't say his hair was white wool. It was white as white wool. White as snow and his eyes were a flame of fire and his feet like unto burnished brass. Why? Because this is the glorified Jesus. This is the Jesus who was glorified dwelling in the light of the invisible immortal God Jehovah. So he has the glory of Jehovah shining through him. This is why his feet are like unto burnished brass as it had been refined in the furnace and his voice is the voice of many waters. As we get into the book of Revelation, I'll also show you that this idea that the 12 tribes of Israel are like Aztecs, Mayans, and you know, or, or blacks, it's just absolutely false. It's absolutely false. Again, another deception. With the, it's a false gospel. <laughs> okay. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth proceedeth the sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Why? Because now he's at the right hand of Jehovah God, and the glory of Jehovah God is dwelling in him, and, out, and he beams the glory of Jehovah God off his being off his uh, countenance. And I saw my fellow at his feet as one dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So Jesus is the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So he's the first and the last. He's the last. He is the firstborn from the dead and the last. He is the last Adam. He is the firstborn from the dead, the first human being ever to be resurrected from the dead, and he is the last Adam. That's a, a, a title given to Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15. He is the last Adam. By way of his resurrection from the dead, he becomes the last Adam, the Edemic king, the Edemic covenant. He is the ruler over all heaven and earth, just like Adam was ruler of the Garden of Eden. He was made king and the son of God by Jehovah. Jesus is the only begotten son of God and his king over the whole earth. And he's the living one. He was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. He's eternal now. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Why? Because when Jesus comes back, he will resurrect the dead, the just and the unjust. Right there for the things which thou sawest and the things which are and the things which shall come to pass hereafter. Meaning right after this revelation is written, the things of the revelation are going to start to unfold 2,000 years ago. Not right now, but 2,000 years ago. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Remember the, in the, the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, there's seven golden candlesticks. So he's talking about the sanctuary. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angels. And the seven candlesticks are seven churches. That's important to, rec to realize. The seven candlesticks are seven churches. And we're going to see that what that, the significance of that as we go to Revelation 11. So that's Revelation chapter one. Um, the things are shortly to come to pass. The time is at hand, meaning they were to start to unfold at the time that the revelation was written, but they apply to us today. Why? Because the last days are a long drawn out war of attrition that started at Jesus' baptism and continue until the last day, the second advent of Christ. All right, salute from the kingdom of the Son of God in the Coachella Valley. Praise be to Jehovah God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, are now reigning the Davidic kingdom.